The following program is rated E. Today on City Line, what women need to know about their health right now. If you don't know what's abnormal or normal, it's really hard for you to even know if you should be seeking care. It's a City Line Real Special, and we've got the expert advice from the world's most famous gynecologist, Dr. Jen Gunter. So she's going to stay for the whole hour. We're keeping her here. Then everything you need to know before you get an IUD. I absolutely love IUDs. They are super effective, more than 99% effective in preventing pregnancy. And later, the effect of so-called health experts on social media. I find myself debunking myths and misinformation a lot more than I have ever been. It's City Life with Tracy Moore. I love the enthusiasm. Welcome to City Line, everyone, and to a very special City Line Real episode. Today is all about women's health and the important things we need to know right now so we can better advocate for ourselves. You might remember us doing a similar show a few months ago where we had a candid chat with City Line makeup artist Grace Lee about her experience with medical gaslighting. Here's a little reminder of that story. Last year, uh, let's just start with, I had my period for six weeks. I called my doctor and I said, it's, it's still going. And she said, go to eMERGE right now. So I waited for 13 hours to see an emergency doctor and he did one blood test. He didn't even test my hormones, but what he told me when the blood test came back was that it was due to my hormones. I did not get an ultrasound. I did not even get an internal exam. And he was very dismissive. Luckily, I had a friend whose husband is also a doctor and told me to go to another hospital that had an emergency OB on site. Yeah. So when I went there, um, my hemoglobin was at 72. You get a blood transfusion at 70. I was literally great. I had an internal exam. I had I had two ultrasounds done. I had an iron infusion that took three hours because my iron was super low. I just could not believe that the care and the assessment was so vastly different. We got so many comments about Grace's story and the show itself. I wanted to read a few. This one came in from Colette. So she said, these experiences happen way too often. Women are constantly being dismissed. It pisses me off. Sophia said, I was told that I had anxiety after giving birth when I complained about not being able to breathe. Turned out I had congestive heart failure. I literally had to shout in the ER that something was wrong with me. A nurse said that I had the baby blues. Had I not advocated for myself, I would not be alive today. Jenny says, I want to personally thank you and your team for offering such an informative show and most importantly for talking about women's health, shedding light on taboo topics, sharing current research, speaking with incredible doctors is so greatly appreciated. I wish this happened more often. So this is us making it happen more often. This is why we decided to do a round two and we have got a great team of experts to help, including gynecologist extraordinaire, Dr. Jen Gunter. In her pink. My pink. So good to have you here. We have talked so many times remotely. It's nice to have you in here in studio with us to get into it for this entire hour. So she's going to stay for the whole hour. We're keeping her here. You wrote, yeah, we're excited about that. You wrote The Menopause Manifesto, The Vagina Bible. These are books that help change the way that we all think and talk about women's health. And you've got a new book. So this is it right here. And it's called Blood, The Science, Medicine, and Mythology of Menstruation. Let's talk about this. Why is this book so needed, Dr. Jen? Well, I think Grace's story is a great example of why this book is needed. You know, it's sad that people have to advocate so much for themselves, but the truth is they do. And if you know how to describe your bleeding in terms that the doctor might be more able to listen to, if you can say, these are the tests I need to have based on the symptoms I'm having, I believe you're more likely to get them. If you don't know what's 
abnormal or normal, it's really hard for you to even know if you should be seeking care, right? Mm. So, you know, if somebody tells you, oh, you're not bleeding for 10 days is normal and you're informed and you know it's not, then you can seek care. Absolutely. And I think that we often just think, well, it's okay. I'll just deal with it. Don't just deal with it if you know it's abnormal. So shame, misinformation. Many of us don't really know what normal is when it comes to our bleeding. How much blood or clotting is too much, would you say? Right. So we say that, first of all, if you think your period is too heavy, I want to hear about it. So, okay. But we have objective measures. So if you're having clots that are bigger than the size of a quarter, if you're having a feeling of gushing, if you're bleeding for more than 10 days, if you're soaking through pads and tampons um, every one to two hours, though mm -hmm. you're soaking onto your clothes or your bed sheets, those are objective signs that you're bleeding too much and you need to come in. We have a, really um, an epidemic of low iron among especially young women. Under the age of 22, it's about 40% of young women. And so, yeah, it's super important that people know what's too heavy so they can get treated. Anemia is a significant medical problem. Okay, so here's a shocking fact. Historically, menstrual produ products haven't been tested using blood. I didn't know this. So they've been using what, like a different kind of liquid substance to yeah. test the product? So they've been using, you know, a saline or water substance um, yeah. and they, they test it. They don't test pa pads, don't have to be tested. So tampons do. Okay. Um, and, you know, whether, whether testing it with animal blood or not would make a difference, it's hard to know because, you know, you don't, you can't really quantify and say, well, oh, I'm having 30 milliliters of blood this cycle, right? Yeah. So, you know, we want to know, you know, light days, medium, heavy, that type of thing. But yeah, they, they haven't used blood products. They've used, um, they've used water products. So let's talk a little bit about the makeup of our menstrual blood. What is it made up of? Yeah, so a lot of people think it's like some kind of like witchy swill that's got like <laughs> hormones in it and it's like special blood. It's just blood from your veins and arteries. So yeah. what happens when you menstruate, the lining of the uterus peels away and what happens just like when you skin your knee, you bleed. And so there's blood that comes out and that blood pushes that lining of the uterus out along with the contractions and that's how the lining gets removed. So it's, men so it's blood and it's lining of the uterus and some cervical mucus and vaginal discharge all mixed together. Okay. And it's anywhere between 30 milliliters and 80 milliliters a cycle. What would a 30 milliliters look like, do you think? Well, we have 80 here, and of okay. course, we used red, not blue, because, you know. Because <laughs> it's blood. Cause it's, so, so this is 80 milliliters. I know it always seems like you're bleeding more, um, but, you know, you get a little bit of blood in the toilet, and it looks like a lot. But obviously, if you look at this and you say, I bleed way more than this, then you need to talk to your medical provider. Right. Over a course of an entire cycle? Yeah, over a course of an entire cycle, yeah. Okay, that's yeah. the up, that's the most. That's the amount of blood, but remember there's like discharge in yeah. it and other things, so it may appear to be a little bit more. Okay, that's fair. Let's talk a little bit about pain. So is period pain just a fact of life? And how do we know when it's actually, it's, it's too painful? It's serious. Yeah, so unfortunately, pain is a byproduct of making the uterus stop bleeding, of having the lining come out. And some people have very little pain or almost no pain, and some people have really bad pain, and people are everywhere in between, and there are also medical conditions that can cause pain. So again, pain is a very personal experience, and I would say that if, the pain, if you feel your pain is affecting your day, then, then you should seek care. Now, many people will be treated very well with over-the-counter like ibuprofen or something like a TENS unit, but other things may also be needed, and you may, may need to have investigations to make sure you don't have a condition like endometriosis or adenomyosis, which can cause pain. So you're saying trust yourself. Yeah, if it's painful, you know if you're having pain. Yeah. You know, it's, if you're having pain, then and it's, it's not going away with taking an ibuprofen, and it's affecting you, absolutely, it's time to talk to somebody. A study found that it takes an average of eight years for someone to receive an endometriosis diagnosis. So our supervising producer was diagnosed with anonymiosis. Adenomyosis, yeah. Adenomyosis, I yeah. can't say it. <laughs> too many consonants, too many vowels, well, Doc. It's not an intuitive word, but adenomyosis, yeah. And so that diagnosis she got in her 40s uh, after years of pain. So what does this tell us? And why does it take so long to find endometriosis? So endometriosis and adenomyosis are different conditions. Um, mm -hmm. Endometriosis is where the lining of the uterus or tissue similar to the lining of the uterus is growing outside in the pelvic cavity. And it can cause severe pain, it can cause infertility, but it's quite enigmatic because people can have a lot of it and also have no symptoms at all. Okay. So we don't really understand. 
I think what the delay tells us is that women have their pain dismissed, mm -hmm. and so they just get sort of pushed off, or they try a therapy and it doesn't work, and then they kind of give up and they'll go back again. You know, and if somebody's telling you, oh, well, you, your pain shouldn't be that bad, you can see why they wouldn't go back, right? Because yep. they're not getting they're not getting the care they need. Yep. We are now changing how we diagnose endometriosis. We're saying that it's okay to make a clinical diagnosis. I mean, you don't have to have surgery, and hopefully that will get more people kind of into appropriate treatment sooner. Also, we can pick up probably two thirds to three quarters of endometriosis with an MRI scan. So okay. we have sort of newer diagnostic modalities as well, but it shouldn't take you know longer. Usually when we put people on medications for pain like ibuprofen or the birth control pill, at most you need a six month trial. So, so there's no excuse for seven years, right? Yeah. There's, there's an absolutely, yes, six months would be appropriate to say we're going to give you this first line treatment and see how it works. Mm -hmm. But at six months, if you're no better, then you need to be moving on to the next thing. Uh, when it comes back to pain then, what can we do if we feel our pain isn't being taken seriously? Yeah, so, so I would say advocate, you know, it's so hard to advocate when you're not being taken seriously. Mm -hmm. um, I've had people take in things that I've written to the doctor. You know, okay. this is like, you know, when they've had uh, other symptoms or menopause symptoms and they haven't been able to get hormones, and they've, they've taken in the menopause manifesto and said, well, Dr. Jen Gunter says this, right? Get the book and take it in. I mean, you shouldn't yeah. have to do that. But, you know, showing your doctor that you've read up on this, you know, this isn't just something you heard in a chat room. You've been going to like legitimate sources to get good quality information and you can print off from the SOGC, you can go to their website, the Society of Obstetricians and Gynecologists of Canada. Mm -hmm. They have information about endometriosis. Take that in and say, hey, you know what, I'm really concerned this might be what's going on. I want a referral to someone who knows. Good advice. Uh, really good info. And guess what, everyone here, you're all going to take home a copy of Dr. Jen's book, Blood, to help you take the mystery out of your menstrual cycle. Oh, we have so much good conversation to come. Stay with us. We're headed to break. Coming up, IUDs, are they worth it? It's this little device and they are highly effective. They're the most, um, among the most effective forms of long acting reversible contraception and very high user satisfaction. City Lines Wellness Wednesdays is brought to you in partnership with Jameson Vitamins. For everyday immune support, Jameson is here for your health. IUDs are supposed to be effective contraceptives that you can set and forget, but are they worth it? We want to talk about it right now. So Dr. Jen Gunter is with me the whole hour, and she's back to share the realities of IUDs. And she's joined by Dr. Antonia Sapong. It's so good to have you here. Um, Dr. Jen, I'm going to start with you. Can you walk us through what an IUD is and how it works? Yeah, so an IUD is an object that goes in the uterus. They're generally shaped like a T, but they can also be frame, what we call frameless and just kind of like more like a wire. And they're inserted, they, uh, there are two different kinds. There's ones with the hormone levonorgestrel and there are ones that with copper. Copper kills sperm and the hormone levonorgestrel changes cervical mucus so sperm can't get through to, um, to fertilize a pregnancy. Okay. And um, the other benefit of the hormonal IUD is that it reduces bleeding. And can you show us how that works? Because you got that cool little yeah, prop over there. Might as well use it. We have a cool little model here. So uh -huh. um, this is the vagina, which isn't normally clear, obviously. Um, <laughs> and the, the uterus is up here. And um, and so what happens is the IUD is going to sit in the uterus. So this we have it comes with a long, thin inserter like a straw, and that there'll be a speculum in the vagina, and this goes in, and then it'll go all the way into the uterus. And then what we do is. We um, deploy it and it pops out like a little T, like that. And then when it's in all the way, we just slide it out. And then the, this is left in the uterus and you have this string here that we cut. And so there's, oh, you can always feel the string. the string. And then that's it. And that's this little device. And they are highly effective. They're the most, um, among the most effective forms of long acting reversible contraception, a very high user satisfaction. Okay, Dr. Tony, let's talk a little bit about the benefits of an IUD over other options. Yeah, I absolutely love IUDs. They are super effective, more than 99% effective in preventing pregnancy. If you change your mind and you want to have children, you can quickly remove it. Fertility goes back to its baseline. Mm -hmm. No remembering your pills or to change your patches, which, let's be honest, it's hard to remember every day to take something. Yeah. And then also they are 
quite therapeutic. So if you have really heavy bleeding, certain menstrual conditions like adenomyosis or polycystic ovarian syndrome, they can also be beneficial for treating that as well or managing some of those symptoms. So they're okay, fantastic good. options. And also prevention, yeah. can, prevention of cancer, yes, right? True. So some women who oh. have irregular bleeding, they're at high risk for developing cancer of the lining of the uterus and the IUD can prevent that. Oh, that's good to know. Okay, well, we've got two women here to share their stories uh, with the IUD. We have Nicole and Megan in the audience. Give them some love. Thank you for coming out. Since they're going to be talking about personal things, so, Nicole, I'll start with you. You're five years into having an IUD. You say it has been life-changing. So tell us about your experience. Yeah, getting an IUD was definitely the best decision for me. Before I was on oral contraceptives, and like you were saying, Dr. Tony, being able to like remember that, the inconvenience, and it also just threw my hormones out of whack, gave me night sweats. So I decided to go with an hormonal IUD. And when I went, uh, two of my girlfriends came with me, and during the insertion process, they said that it would be discomfort. At some point, it was more than that. It was like a sharp pain that I'd never felt before. And one of my friends said, based on my reaction, she's probably never getting one. <laughs> but thankfully, that only lasted for me during insertion. Afterwards, everything was fine. And I haven't had a period in over four years. So it's just the freedom and convenience has been unmatched. <laughs> Okay, excellent. And that's okay that she hasn't had a period. That's the part of it, right? That's yeah. okay. Megan, we also have Megan in the audience. So your experience was a bit more negative. Tell us what happened with you. Yeah, so I ended up getting an IUD because I just wasn't taking the oral contraceptive as much as I could remember at least. Um, and so I went into getting an IUD with not as much knowledge, that, knowledge as I should have. Um, I went in and I was told to take uh, Advil half an hour before I was getting it put in to help ease the discomfort and my discomfort immediately it was straight on intense it started getting worse as the hours and days went on um, I did end up passing out from the pain within an hour of getting it uh, inserted and from there on out the the discomfort lasted quite some time I was told it would only last a few days and it lasted probably a few weeks um, I was then in and out of the ER being told that my pain and discomfort was completely unrelated to an IUD. It wasn't anything to worry about. I was basically dismissed. And then uh, after a year, the pain and discomfort came back and I couldn't, I couldn't um, deal with it at that point. So I just went and had it removed. And from here on out, I've been dealing with um, flare ups of discomfort and just not, not comfortable whatsoever. I so appreciate you sharing that with us. And we want to sort of get into what might be happening when you have pain or experience the kind of pain that Megan had. So we're going to take a quick break right now, and we'll hear from the doctors after the break. So stay with us, everyone. Coming up, the IUD discussion continues. I think that medicine in general has a communication issue, and sitting down and explaining what's actually going to happen with the IUD insertion should be part of it. You, yes, you. I've got a seat in City Line's audience waiting just for you. Head to cityline.tv slash tickets to go behind the scenes with your favorite experts, the chance of great giveaways, plus all the unexpected fun of bringing City Line to your screens. What are you waiting for? Go click. We can't wait to see you. Just tuning in, today's City Line Real episode is all about all the information that women need to have. And we're back with Dr. Tony Sapong and Dr. Jen Gunter. So before the break, we heard from Nicole and Megan about their experiences using IUDs. And Dr. Jen, I want to get into just there's such different stories, such different, uh, you know, outcomes with their IUD experience. Why aren't people being warned about the possibility of significant pain uh, or complications that come with IUDs? Well, I think that medicine in general has a communication issue and sitting down and explaining what's actually going to happen with the IUD insertion should be part of it. Um, a lot of people don't realize that there has to be a speculum that goes in the vagina. It's going to be cranked open really wide, that we may have to use an instrument to stabilize the uterus. There are pain thing, pain control mechanisms that we can use. We can put numbing medicine around the cervix. We can give people a medication for anxiety if needed. Having a person there with you as almost like an IUD doula can be helpful. So there are many things they can do. You know, anxiety also makes pain worse. So if you don't know what's going to happen to your body, 
Um, there are some people who are more likely to have pain with insertion, people who have pain with sex, or people who have pelvic pain. So we want to know about it. So that's all that communication is super important. What the data tells us is about 50% of people have very, you know, what we would call mild to moderate experiences, meaning their pain scores are five or less. And, and obviously for them, they don't need very much. There are other people who are going to have higher pain scores. And for them, more things might be needed. And that's okay. You need the pain control you need. You need what you need. Uh, Dr. Tony, what are typical and atypical side effects after insertion? Yeah, it's helpful to know what you're signing yourself up for. Mm -hmm. um, typically, like Dr. Gunter was saying, it can be painful during the actual insertion. I usually say it's, you know, crampy, possibly sharp pain, like a bad period. This is normal. Okay. And then afterwards, what to expect. Um, usually, again, cramping can last. Usually, some women, it's a few hours. Some, it can be longer, 24, 48 hours. I would say this is normal. Slowly improving over the, about the course of a week, I'd expect people to sort of be back to their baseline. Mm -hmm. um, other things to know, after an IUD, there can be spotting. This is normal. We've done a procedure. We've gone into the uterus. Spotting right after, totally normal. With the hormonal IUDs, um, that spotting can actually last quite a bit longer because of the progestin that's in there, thins the lining, and so you can have some shedding that goes on for sort of three, sometimes up to six months, and this is considered normal. Okay. If you are having heavy bleeding, so like severe bleeding, you're soaking through a pad more than every hour for more than, you know, a couple of hours, this is not normal. You should be seeking medical attention. Um, really severe pain out of the ordinary that is excruciating. Again, these are not normal things. I would mm -hmm. seek medical attention. Spotting that goes on for years? This is a this is is this normal? This is not this is not what I would consider normal. Okay. There's always gonna be outliers when we talk about what different people are experiencing. Yeah. Um, yeah. and unfortunately sometimes that is the case. It is not often. I wouldn't say it's typical, and I would certainly say like you wanna make sure that you've been checked out and that's been worked up. Make sure there's no other problems happening at the same time. Got also, it. for people who are having persistent spotting, there mm -hmm. are medical therapies for that. Yeah. There are okay. things that we can do to stop the spotting, right? right? Now again, there are always outliers and there might be people those things don't work for, but yeah. But it's very important to know the things that we can do. And when people have, you know, that, that pain experience that we heard about that took you back to the emergency department, it's super important that the doctors actually investigate to find out why that pain is going on. Because many people who have a lot of pain after an IUD insertion actually develop muscle spasm around the vagina because when the speculum's inserted and it's opened really wide and you have that painful triggering, it can actually cause that muscle spasm. And so there can be also other things that could be triggered as well, but so we would want some to actually get a proper evaluation mm. and and that's awful you know somebody shouldn't be shunted from ER to ER they should be seeing someone who understands about pain who can take that seriously so you have to just keep going until someone gives you an answer well yeah I mean you should be asking Sometimes. to be referred to someone who can give you an answer yeah. yeah okay that's fair yeah I mean and it's not that onus shouldn't be on the patient you know no. if, if I'm a doctor in the emergency department and someone's coming in over and over again like I should be looking at who I can send that person to so they can get help if I'm the gynecologist and I can't and explain their pain. I shouldn't just say, oh, well, I don't know. I sh you should look for the person who can help with the explanation. Absolutely. So there is a call for better pain management. What are the options that can be asked for, Dr. Tony? Yeah, I mean, it really depends. I think it's important to have a conversation with your provider um, to explore what options are available because some of us have access to different things. Mm -hmm. um, so for instance, in my office, we talk about things like painkillers before you come in for the procedure, so Tylenol, mm -hmm. Advil. I personally like naproxen because it tends to work better for the cramping after the insertion. Mm -hmm. um, some of us have access to the numbing agents that Dr. Gunter was talking about, so lidocaine, either um, a lidocaine spray or an actual injection into the cervix, which can be quite helpful in reducing the pain. Um, and then other things like breathing techniques and having someone there with you and mm -hmm. just having a good explanation and an understanding of what's going to happen so that your anxiety is already lower, this is also tremendously beneficial. And then there's also these severe cases where people know that they have severe pain maybe going into it um, that aren't going to be appropriate to do in my family doctor's office and that's when I would refer to an obstetrician gynecologist because they have more options available to them. Yeah. Okay. And I think, um, you know, it's also important to to just really go through the options. Some people are like, look, I, I don't want to have to take any time off work. Other people are like, I don't want to have to have any pain. Everybody has different things, how they, you know, how they feel about it. And so mm -hmm. it's important to kind of talk about that beforehand. Also, I tell people if you have a TENS unit, bring it in. So oh, TENS right. units are very effective. Well, they help menstrual pain. They're quite effective. They can mm -hmm. reduce pain scores by about 10%. And so I'll tell people you can put it on during the IUD insertion too. And it's just kind of another little trick. What is it? 
So it's a device that is like a, got a little battery pack and it's got little pads that you put, you know, over your uterus or over the front of, or over your lower back and it sends an electrical impulse to the nerves and muscles and it reduces pain. Um, if you go to my website, The Vagenda, I have actually pictures of where you would put it. Oh. Um, and there's a study that shows that it reduces pain with medication abortion. So if it reduces pain from that, you'd think that it could possibly help with IUD insertion as well. Mm -hmm. And so I recommend people try that as well. That's good. Okay, thank you so much for this conversation. We're going to have a list of things you should discuss with your doctors about IUDs on our website. Go to cityline.tv for that, and we're going to go to break. More coming up. Coming up, the importance of getting medical information from reputable sources. People need to understand that just because someone goes on into a chat room or someone on TikTok or someone on Instagram says something about their own personal fertility experience, it's not necessarily going to be yours. We have seen such a shift from traditional sources like books and early internet searches to interactive platforms like TikTok, Instagram, and even AI-driven content. This shift has brought about both merits and concerns, particularly in how health information is presented and consumed. So the internet's gynecologist, Dr. Jen, is back now to talk about uh, the media's role in women's health. And we've got Dr. Marjorie Dixon with us as well. Thank you for coming. I see that you're both on this, you're in your Barbie era, both of you, exactly. looking very good. We got the memo. You yeah. got the memo. We're going to start with you, Dr. Dixon. So how has the digital revolution reshaped the way we are taking in information about women's health? So the, the digital explosion has, in a way, <laughs> helped. Because initially, when I was coming on the show in 2009, we were really educating and empowering women with information about women's health. Mm -hmm. It was destigmatizing. People were embarrassed to talk about it. We did endometriosis, fibroids, fertility. Now people talk about it. So it's done a service in one way. Yeah. But on the other hand, I find myself debunking myths and misinformation a lot more than I have ever been mm -hmm. by virtue of these platforms <laughs> and these doctors that pop up on the platforms as, as experts, as digital experts that aren't necessarily so. So you ha sort of have to be careful and weed out the fake news. Dr. Jen, there is a lot of advice going out there on TikTok these days. What impact do you see that the health and wellness gurus, <laughs> what impact are they having on us? Yeah, a lot of negative impact. So I see lots of people coming in on just reams of supplements that they don't need. Um, people wanting to have testing that isn't indicated. Um, I see people who have stopped their birth control to do uh, fertility testing, at-home testing, which we don't recommend. And then they get a result saying that maybe they won't be able to get pregnant, so they don't go back on contraception. And six weeks later, they've got an unplanned pregnancy. Mm -hmm. So there are some real, real you know, complications, anxiety from people wearing continuous glucose monitors who don't need them, eating disorders triggered from all these, you know, diets that we see. It's really a hot mess out there. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about fertility. Uh, how has this impacted fertility health specifically, according to you, Dr. Marjorie? Yeah, so the one big one downside, we've talked about timeliness is of the essence when you're trying to figure out your fertility. So, mm -hmm. you know, women are having babies later, et cetera. But then they'll find something online and they will sort of settle on it as, as biblical, mm -hmm. as the gospel. And it inadvertently delays their time coming to treatment. So we're all about accessibility, getting the information, but getting in to see a specialist sometimes takes time. You don't want to delay that further because you've gotten misinformation. Yeah. And people need to understand that just because someone goes on into a chat room or someone on TikTok or someone on Instagram says something about their own personal fertility experience, it's not necessarily going to be yours. And so you have to really find a reliable source. That, that's been the hardest thing for fertility patients, I think, getting misguided mm -hmm. and waiting to get to care. Well, let's talk about sources then, because how do we, Dr. Jen, figure out what's real and what's not real online? Like, the, it's the wild, wild west. Yeah. I see a lot of bad information coming out from chat rooms as well. And in fact, some of these chat rooms actually kick people out who start like, you know, saying, hey, that's not quite right. Oh. And so, so you have to be very, very careful about that type of thing. 
you know, I would say that anyone who is selling you a product, if they're selling you a supplement, if they're selling you a diet, if they're selling you something, then they're a salesperson. They're not a health communicator, right? Mm -hmm. I would say that you want to look for someone that's truly an expert. Now, that's not a guarantee. There yeah. are doctors selling scammy stuff, right. as mm -hmm. we all know. Mm -hmm. um, there are registered dietitians selling scammy diets. But in general, if you want to look for a registered dietitian, you want to look for a physician, you want to look for a physical therapist, you want to look, depending on sort of the area that you're looking for, and then you want to see, can you verify what they say from a recognized expert? So does their respective a medical society, if you look on their site, so if it's an OBGYN, you go to the Society of Obstetricians and Gynecologists of Canada, can you find that same information there? Mm hmm Okay, so you've actually called us out before on social mm -hmm. media because of research we cited. You know, we accept culpability there. <laughs> so what does one do when there is scientific evidence and studies on opposing viewpoints? So, because we think, oh, well, there's a study, and the study says this. But then there's also a study that says the opposite. Right. So first of all, I just want to thank you for being one of the only media that I've ever worked with that has actually taken that kind of feedback and said, hey, we need to do better. So mm -hmm. that, that really says yeah. a lot. Absolutely. We're trying to make sure our audience has the best information possible right. so we could use the help. Right. You know, just tell us what we, sh we can do better in the future if we've got opposing studies. Yeah, so it's very difficult because, you know, science, first of all, is complex and it changes. So what we knew 10 years ago isn't what we know now. Mm -hmm. And so people often think, well, but if you change your mind about that, that means you might change your mind again. I think that when we start to see, it's very important not to make big decisions based on one study. Mm -hmm. In general, in medicine, we want to see multiple studies that the, all of the experts have agreed on this is kind of going in the right direction because we've also heard a lot about scientific fraud and papers that have been mm -hmm. retracted. So we want to see this thing multiple times. If something is worth changing a medical opinion over, it's almost always in a society guideline. There's always like a position paper, there's something written about that. And it can be very challenging because people will share articles and they might even be in what's called a predatory journal, meaning it's a junk journal that we mm -hmm. shouldn't even be looking at. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's good to know. Uh, let's talk about how we can be more aware of what is sponsored medical information, yeah, Dr. So Dixon. When you talk about um, media, there's paid, earned, social media, and owned. Mm -hmm. And people don't recognize that a lot of the things that doctors can get behind, they've paid to promote themselves. Mm -hmm. In fact, you have to be very discerning. Did you know that it's reasonable? So, there's something called search engine optimization. So it's fair game on the internet for a doctor to buy another doctor, for example, my name, to promote their business. Mm. That's legitimate, it sounds fraudulent, but these things happen, and who are the predators, who, who falls prey to it? Patients. So patients mm -hmm. will look up a doctor that they know is reasonable, that's associated with the Canadian Fertility and Andrology Society, or the American Society for Reproductive Medicine, infertility, reliable governing bodies, but then get pulled into another website and not get reliable information. So patients have to be very careful. Even they go to a website and they have a chat bot. They think they're talking immediately with Susan or Jennifer, but it's a programmed chat room that is also still in its infancy online. Mm -hmm. So it's getting trained to manage patients. So you have to be careful about the information you get when you think you're having a conversation with a medical professional, but it's a chat bot. And eventually it might get somewhere reasonable, but yeah. patients need to be aware that often they can be duped. And so it's important to be very discerning because paid ads, things that people promote, taking other people's names for your gain without getting better information for patients is my bugbear. It drives me crazy. Yeah. We're trying to get information to patients in the right way, so you have to be discerning. It also chips away at your credibility is if they're dragging your name into things that are not true, right? Mm -hmm. That that's not cool. Mm -hmm. Okay, what role should doctors and media play in ensuring the accuracy of health information in the media, Dr. Jen? Well, I think that, you know, physicians really have a duty to speak up. Not everybody mm -hmm. is as comfortable, you know, being on TV or, you know, spouting things off on social media. <laughs> and that's okay. We all have different areas of expertise, but people can help give more information in the office so people don't feel they need to go online as much. Mm -hmm. But I think also media has to really realize that there aren't two valid sides to every story. Mm -hmm. That sometimes there are things that are really, this is really it. And people who are promoting an alternate view aren't medically accurate. And the story is sometimes just one-sided and that's okay. And yeah. 
you know, there are exciting ways to present to present that information. Always. If it goes viral, doesn't mean it's real. Yeah. Right. And, and women fall prey. We're very open-minded. So we'll say, that other argument, I heard that, but maybe this is real too. There doesn't mm -hmm. always have to be a reasonable opponent, uh, opponent side. Yeah, opposing, yeah, yeah, yeah. And propaganda works. So studies tell us that it takes five exposures to ridiculous information to start to believe that it could be true. How ridiculous? The earth is a perfect square. The tallest person is 35 feet. Mm -hmm. Those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. So if you think about TikTok or Instagram and you're on and you see a reel and it's bad information and you watch it all the way through to the end, that tells the algorithm you want to watch that content all the way through to the end. So your whole feed is now contaminated mm -hmm. with that. That's why I see shark attack videos all the time because I'm <laughs> terrified of those. <laughs> I see dogs. <laughs> I like watching puppies, right? Oh my gosh. So we have to like train our feeds as well. Uh -huh. You have train to the algorithm to follow reputable sources yes. and yes. reputable and information. Curate your resources. Yeah. Curate it. And, Ooh. Yeah, and block people who are spreading misinformation. If you see somebody who they have great fashion tips, but they're also promoting a supplement, block them because you know what? There's people who are promoting great fashion tips who aren't selling a supplement. Right. People don't deserve your attention, they should earn it. And if they're trying to profit off you in ways like that, then they don't actually care about you, they care about your money. Absolutely, good advice. Let's go to break. More coming up. Coming up, we're talking menopause and women's health. That was actually the start of me really entering what was gonna be my perimenopause, but I didn't know it was that, and I spent maybe two years with doctors getting testing done and coming away with really more questions than answers. Welcome back, everyone. Dr. Jen is back to talk menopause and women's mental and physical health, along with personal trainer and author Amanda Thebe. Welcome, welcome. Yeah. Thank you for coming. Um, you've had quite a journey, Amanda, through menopause, which resulted in this menopocalypse. Look at her on the cover looking all strong. <laughs> so tell us what it was like for you, your journey, how it led to this book. You said you actually went through depression. So what was your journey like? Yeah, when I was about 42, I was feeling pretty strong and healthy in my 40s. But then after a really hard boxing class, I sort of didn't feel great. You know, when you've done too much and yes. you feel a bit exhausted. But that was actually the start of me really entering what was going to be my perimenopause. But I didn't know it was that. And I spent nearly two years with doctors getting testing done and coming away with really more questions than answers. And I really wasn't well. I had chronic migraines and depression. And I didn't know they were hormonal. And I eventually got answers when I was 44, and it sort of sent me down that perimenopause rabbit hole. You know, I, I was disgusted that I didn't know what was happening, and I realized that if I didn't know, then probably lots of other women didn't know either. It wasn't talked about. Perimenopause was not talked about, not even when I started hosting this show. Like, people I didn't, weren't publicly talking about it. Exactly. I didn't, I'd never heard of the word perimenopause mm -hmm. at all. Yeah. Uh huh. Okay, so, and that led you, what was your treatment? What did they give you to help ease the symptoms? So, my doctor initially offered me hormone therapy, and I tried that for about three or four years, different, ther different um, formulations, mm -hmm. but I didn't do well on the hormones. I had a sensitivity to them that actually made my perimenopause worse, really mm -hmm. bad, really bad depression, and, and my migraines increased as well, and so I ended up taking an antidepressant. And I think sometimes they get a bad rap, but for me, they really help me through the hard times. Amazing. Yeah. Dr. Jen, for you, uh, what kind of symptoms did you have? Yeah, so I had really bad hot flashes, uh -huh. um, and then irregular periods, which is you know very common. But bad hot flashes, that was really it. Uh, and I went on you know estrogen mostly to treat the hot flashes, but also because I have a very strong family history of osteoporosis. That's what my mother died from. Mm -hmm. And so you know if you're going to treat your hot flashes with estrogen, you may as well get the benefit for protecting the bones. And because I'm at very high risk because of you know my health history, um, you know that's what I'm going to stay on long term to keep my bones protected. Okay, so we can see then that hormones are not always going to be the answer. It really is going in on a case-by-case -case basis to figure out what is good for your body and what works for you. Um, I want to talk about what we should keep in mind when it comes to menopause and physical health. So what are the basics that we urgently need to consider 
other than medical treatment? Well, for me, like, I knew that I was stressed as well. During this period, my body was under stress, and usually when you're highly stressed, it makes the symptoms worse. And yeah. so even though I was a fitness expert, I was struggling to get exercise in. I just was too tired and exhausted and depressed. Mm -hmm. um, and I realised that, you know, it was so important to try and manage my stresses and to move more. And so... For me, one of the biggest things that women can do and should do, especially for longevity and moving forward, is to move as much as possible. Mm -hmm. And specifically, if they can look to do some strength training in that movement too. What's strength training going to do? What does it do for you? Well, I there's so many benefits of strength training. I mean, we were talking before, it's like the, the one of the best medicines out there. And I think for me, the reason all women should strength train over all of the physical and mental health benefits is that perimenopause can leave us feeling a little bit less than we feel and maybe we don't recognize ourselves. It's one of the most empowering things we can do and um, it just makes us feel capable again. And I think that that's really important. It's so, it's that, that whole situation of feeling confident and feeling like you can do things. Yep. I can't overstate how important that is to feel capable, to actually see your body do things that maybe you didn't think you could do. And also, it doesn't have to be, a, you know, a big hour-long workout. It could be a walk. Like, moving, movement is the thing that I think that really helps us. Well, I think that one of my biggest pieces of advice that I give to women is, first of all, check in with yourself. How are you feeling? What do you yeah. think you're capable of today? Start small. Do it on repeat, mm -hmm. be consistent. That's actually how you build up motivation as well. And then just like stay the course because you will become curious and you'll be questioning what else your body can do. Mm -hmm. And usually it's more. <laughs> yes, usually it's more. Yeah. Well, we have an audience uh, member with a question for Dr. Jen. Uh, so Tanya, Tanya Simpson in our audience, what would you like to ask? Hi guys, um, I just had a quick question. I, in July of last year, I was a year without my period, um, so I thought I was kind of in the clear. So this January, not even a month ago, I got my period back, so 18 months, so a year and 18 months later, and it came back full force, almost for a full week, heavier than I've normally had. I just don't know, is that normal? Um, it just seemed very, totally out of the blue and everything kind of started up again. Right, how old are you? Uh, just turned 52. Okay, so it may be normal, sometimes people, throw off kind of a rogue egg, you know, kind of, you know, 18 <laughs> months afterwards. But it can also be a sign of endometrial cancer. And we don't know which one it is. Okay. And so it doesn't mean that that's, you have cancer or anything like that. Mm -hmm. But any bleeding when you're more than one year after your final period should be investigated. Okay. And that might mean an ultrasound, a screening ultrasound. It might mean a biopsy from the lining of the uterus. It could mean different things depending on your personal health history, but it's absolutely something you should communicate with your provider. Fantastic, okay, thank you so much. Fantastic, thank you for asking that question and thank you for all of the expertise. I love it, let's go to break. A little more coming up, stay with us. City Lines experts can help you. We're looking for suggestions. What would you recommend? What tips might you have? With everything from decor dilemmas. I'm wondering if you can help me with a sunken living room. Fashion finds. And what to wear as the mother of the bride. Fabulous food and so much more. You are in good hands. Send us your videos, pictures, and questions to submissions at cityline.tv or scan the code on your screen to get expert advice for real life. Let me know. Thanks. Ready to unleash a brand new you? Wow, you're like a million bucks. <laughs> City Lines Glam Squad wants to give you the makeover of your dreams. Head to cityline.tv and click on the makeover tab or just scan the code on your screen. Oh my goodness! Your new look is only a click away. brings us to the end of the show. Incredible information on the show today. Thank you so much to Dr. Jen Gunter who joined us for the whole hour. <laughs> Thanks to Dr. Tony, Dr. Marjorie, and Amanda. And thank you to everyone watching us at home. Thank you to our fantastic studio audience and all of our folks who weighed in. Thank you. Have a great day, everyone. We'll see you back here tomorrow.